Good evening and a warm namaste to all the leaders who have joined us from far and near to this special strategic leadership session with Dr. B.K. Simerson. Thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. I would like to start with a few house rules before we start the program. Please keep yourself muted throughout the session. There'll be a brief 10 to 15 minutes of Q&A at the end of the session. So do try to keep your videos on at that time. Also, uh, Dr. Simerson has, we have compiled all the questions that was asked to you in the form that you were registering in, and he has made a comprehensive session for all of us. This talk session has been possible in association with QKS, 3DI, and UARD. Quality Kathmandu School was established in 2017 with some like-minded, passionate educators who believe that there can be a change in the quality um, of, the, of Nepal and society. We educators try to work hand in hand in collaboration to uplift the student development and also uh, the staff professional development. Over the few years, we have worked together in the same line and have had quarterly meetings where we, ma we made sure that there would be some educational leadership trainings for the school leaders and also for the teachers and students and also planned for joint programs such as art, choir and sports and many job alike workshops for teachers we called JAWS. We are indeed proud that QKS has made a niche for itself and we are pleased to include more members into our fraternity. The second person who, or the second team who has been very much in this process of bringing this uh, leadership strategic roundtable is 3DI. 3DI needs no introduction as most of the schools here are already implementing it. Srijana Pradhan from 3DI is someone who I appreciate immensely for she's someone who is not only very humble, but someone who has made a market for 3DI. And during this unprecedented times of COVID, they have helped a number of schools with trainings and other activities. They were also able to engage our learners in a variety of contests where we could see a lot of interest and zeal for our learners. The most important person and someone I can truly say that has been a catalyst to improve the education in Nepal is someone who has been instrumental in bringing this session together. He has always been there and I want to extend my deepest gratitude for coordinating and bringing such an important person to share with us today. Craig Hansen is the Director of University of Applied research and development, and he's also the founder of Masters of Education program, a Google certified innovator, a Flipgrid global ambassador, and a Microsoft master educator expert. I would like to thank you, Craig, for being a friend of Nepal and sharing with us the most innovative global practices that is around the world and coordinating this virtual platform by bringing Dr. Simerson amongst us today. We are all super eager and excited to learn today. So I would like to invite you on the virtual screen without any delay to introduce our speaker for today. Over to you, Craig. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Deputy Ma'am. Thank you so much for um, helping us arrange tonight. It is our honor and our privilege. Um, I just want to remind everyone, please do mute yourselves because we are going to be recording the session tonight. Maybe I speak too fast and uh, Dr. BK is very enthusiastic and maybe you miss something that either one of us say, my question and his answer. So we are recording so that you have a copy of this afterwards as well. So we just ask everybody to mute themselves so that we can have very clear recording and we can share this after the session. It's my honor to introduce Dr. BK Simerson now. And so I'd like to share with you, he has a range of expertise in strategy formulation, change leadership, organizational effectiveness, and leadership development. And he has a proven record spanning over two decades, really helping and developing and implementing strategic plans and doing leadership development. Uh, previously, he's helped develop and implement a five-year strategic plan for a $6 billion professional services firm. He's worked with the military. He's done executive coaching in the government, a range of industries like heavy machinery, medical devices, education, food manufacturing, all around the world in Canada, Iraq, Argentina, Mexico, Germany, and Italy, to name but a few. So it is my honor to welcome this evening, Dr. B.K. Simerson to join us. And tonight I've summarized with Ma'am Dipti and Sri Jana and Dr. B.K. Um, the 133 questions that all of you have submitted. We've summarized those and put them together into six, six main questions representing the themes of what you ask. So it's my honor to go through those tonight. 
I'll just invite Dr. BK to uh, unmute yourself and just say hi before we start with the questions. Just unmute yourself, Dr. BK. <laughs> Everybody else, if you can please mute yourself or Dr. BK unmutes himself. And I've just unmuted. Good evening, everyone. I hope that everyone's having a great evening in your part of the world. Thank you, sir. Let's jump into it because your time is precious. And um, we'll start with our very first question, which was submitted by a number of principals and leaders. And the question is about buy-in, buy-in. So what are the tactics that leaders should use in an ongoing manner to build shared ownership with their staff and their teams and to also increase productivity with their team members? I consider that to be a critical question because regardless of your focus or your emphasis, you seldom are productive you seldom achieve without the buy-in, the commitment, and the contribution of others. And oftentimes you rely not only on your personal team, but on your expanded team. So the question becomes, how do you ensure buy-in and commitment? And there is a tactic, there is a, an answer uh, that research and experience suggest will work for you. And that is to make sure to the extent possible that you allow individuals to contribute, to participate in, to be part of your effort. And it's important that you involve them at the very front end, not after you have made your key decisions, not after the plan is in place. Do not put together a plan, throw it over the wall and ask others to execute it and expect them to be fully bought in and committed to your effort. So involve them up front. If necessary, involve a few number, but expand it and involve others as quickly as possible. For example, if you know that it is, it is not feasible to include individuals at the very beginning, as soon as you possibly can, once you make your initial decisions, involve them by asking them, so what does this mean to you in terms of what you're asked to do on a daily basis? And what are we going to do together to bring this goal, this vision, this plan to reality? And equally important, ask what can I do to assist and support you as you move forward? So it doesn't stop with a one-time event. It sounds like, Dr. BK, that you are, once you get one lot of feedback, then you're going back again to reframe it for the next stage. Am I understanding that correctly? That is correct. And it's interesting because a lot of individuals recognize the need for input and feedback because without feedback, you cannot continuously improve your approach your process or your mechanism, but they do not create a channel that will allow that feedback to move throughout the organization, either horizontally or vertically. So it's important that you spend some time at the very front end deciding that if we want individuals to provide feedback, how are they going to do that? How can we make it easy for them to do that on a not a monthly or six months or yearly basis, but how can we have a process in place that allows them to provide us our, uh, the information we need to factor into our thinking on an almost daily basis. So what would be part of the, the, the choosing process then? Because I would imagine those first few people are really critical, are really important. So how would you choose those people to be the first ones involved in the process? I would, I would recommend that you consider creating a matrix. And in that matrix, list the number of factors that you feel are important for you to move forward. For example, you may want individuals with content expertise. 
you may want individuals who are the informal leaders of various stakeholder groups. You may want individuals there that has uh, historical knowledge of your culture and your organization. You may want individuals there that have technical expertise. And so once you put down the factors that you'll be using, the criteria that you use in making your, select, your selection, you can start identifying individuals. And then to the extent that you can have a five, 10, 15, or 20 person committee or team or task force, then go with as many as you can uh, possibly allow. So if we build that matrix and then we identify the skills or the strengths or knowledge that those people would have, how, how critical or how important it is, is it to have people of a certain type of personality who might be on that task force? What would you look for? Oh, oh gosh, you know, it's interesting because when you think of personality, you immediately think of the extroverts versus the introverts. Well, you want a combination of extroverts and introverts because if you have extroverts, they're going to want to draw things to a conclusion. They're going to want to, make, to move forward. They're going to want to influence the process. But if you do that without an, an adequate amount of thought and perspective and consideration, then you may, may be making changes that are not the right changes. So you need the introverts to be involved for that deeper thinking, but you also need the extroverts to be involved to make sure that process uh, accomplishment and achievement occur. So it's interesting that you need a combination, you need a balance. Uh, there are individuals who are just naturally uh, talented at looking at a breadth of issues and items and uh, considerations. And there's other individuals that are just naturally talented in drilling down into the depth of the issue or the consideration. So you want both people at the table. You want individuals that think broadly, also deeply. And I'm sure that um, like me, many people who are watching right now and listening are seeing in their minds people, because I'm seeing the pictures of people's faces in my mind from the different organizations I work with who I think, oh yes, I need that person. I need that mm -hmm. type of person. I just want to encourage everyone as we move on to the second part of that question in the chat, if you have questions, please drop them in the chat because Dipti will be watching the chat and I'm going to pause throughout this so that Dipti can check and see if there are questions around this on these particular topics as we talk through them. Then at the end, we'll have some, some open Q&A time in the chat as well. So please do drop questions around each of these topics as we go through them. So uh, Dr. BK, with the second part of that question is then if we're building that buy-in, and using those strategies that you've talked about, how do we then use that to increase productivity in the staff and the team and the workforce? Well, you know, it's interesting because a lot of times you have a relatively small number of people making decisions and deciding on changing the course of the organization or changing your systems or your processes or your technology. And you may have all these conversations. You may have two or three weeks or two or three months of conversations to drill down to a conclusion and a decision. And even though you and this small team have made the decision, the rest of the organization may not know anything about it. So whenever you introduce a major change to the members of your organization, they're going to have to go through a change process, a transition process, where they are considering, so how does this compare with what has made me uh, previously successful, what's contributed to my previous success, and how do I need to factor this into my future? They need to, they, they give thought to, do I have the knowledge, skills, and abilities? Am I capable of moving forward into this new direction? So as individuals are sitting there, and sometimes they're literally sitting there thinking about all of these issues, you have a drop in productivity. And if you combine that with the uh, conversations that occur with their colleagues and their associates at the proverbial water cooler, then you have an increased drop in productivity. So if you can involve and include individuals at the front end, there will be an informal communication that occurs 
that will help individuals to begin preparing for the change, begin preparing for the transition. And so you will either shorten that drop in productivity or you will lever, you will level it out so that it is not pronounced. So the magnitude will be much less. I can see a lot of people around around the room and nodding and recognizing, yes, when we put in an, an, an initiative, there is that realization that things slow down in the organization. That's, that's quite a good insight. Um, how does that communication and increasing that communication, does it have an impact on trust? And is that important? Well, the communication is, in, is absolutely critical. But when you send out any message to your followers, and it doesn't matter if it's an internal or external follower, if you send a message that we will do this, then you have to move mountains if necessary to make sure that that will occur. If you feel that you're going to strive, that you're going to put forth the effort, but there is a 50% chance that it may not come to pass, then you need to be very specific and precise in your communication to let individuals know that this is our intent, this is what we're going to try to do, however we may not accomplish it to the full extent. So your messaging needs to be spot on in terms of setting expectations and assumptions because if you do not follow through on your communication, then people will think that you're not as good as your word and that is a key element in terms of building trust. Probably the people who are familiar with John Hattie's work will recognize that one of the highest contributors to learning is teacher efficacy and confidence. And what Dr. BK is just talking about there is that, that, that building that sense of the follower can trust the leader because he or she will do what they say and they can do what they say. I just want to note, I can see Chen Ryan and Dipti are, are writing in their notebooks. So everybody, I do hope you've got a notebook because this is real gold. I've got half a page done. Chen Ryan's holding his up. Yep, he knows he's a note taker, same as Dipti. Hope everyone's making notes. This is gold. Um, BK, it struck me as you were talking then about people will sit there and they will listen to what you're saying. They'll hear the communication and they'll be noticing this is what's needed from me in the past. This is what's needed from me now and I can do. And the organization's going in this direction. And there will be those people who, and I've been one of those people, who will sit there and go, oh my gosh, I, I don't think I have what it takes. I don't have what needs to be inside me to make this next move. How do we support them? I automatically think of what information individuals need, what equipment and supplies individuals need, what knowledge, skills, abilities, and capabilities people need, but also, and this is where we oftentimes fall short. Oftentimes I forget about, I need to give them the time to think through this and to transition naturally, just like the members of your team did as you were having those days, weeks, or months of conversations. So whenever you think about an individual's capability, think about an individual as being capable. Think about an individual being self-confident and being self-motivated. And if an individual is self-confident and self-motivated, but they are not producing or they're not likely to produce, then you have to think about so what is lacking in terms of capability? And when it comes to capability, it could be any knowledge, skill, or ability. It could be that they are lacking in the ability to be as resilient as needed given the magnitude of change. Or it could be that based on all the other things that they're doing, they do not have any more capacity to do what is being asked. So make sure that in addition to the capability questions you ask, really step back and ask, are we being fair? Are we being realistic in what we're asking of them? Because oftentimes you'll find that they are capable, they are self-confident, they are self-motivated, but they're up to here in terms of what's being asked. You know, one thing that I should have said in the previous answer to the previous question, is that in addition to individuals trusting you, 
you have to prove to them almost on a daily basis that you trust them. And one of the things that you can do to trust them is let them know that you know that they're going to be uncomfortable, that there's going to be discomfort, and that we're going to work through this discomfort together. And that if you need additional information, I will do what I can to support that. If you need more time, I will give you as much time as I possibly can. And if you do need additional information, then we will have workshops. We will have performance support systems put in place. We will have guidelines. We'll have guide sheets. We will have whatever information, whatever support you need in the form that's going to benefit you the most. That's great. Thank you. Uh, Dipti, have you noticed any questions in the chat around this topic that we want to address now, or shall we move on? Um, there is a question, but it was for the previous question. Uh, can I, do I see it? Please do. That was one big the question. The question is actually in the... Yeah, there was a question. So, um, Nikendra has asked, in the process, if any conflict arises amongst the teammates, then what are various ways to mitigate the conflict-like situation when, it, when you're giving them roles or when you're giving them work? Well, you know, it's interesting because, uh, the, for example, if you in your decision-making have decided to change the structure of the organization, and, and there is uh, almost a trend uh, to move from your traditional hierarchy-type organization to more of a matrix organization. And if you're, inter if you're introducing a new structure to your organization, like matrix, then matrix in and of itself requires your individuals to be able to manage uh, paradox. Because when you have a matrix organization, you have individuals reporting to different people, they are, they're responding to different priorities, they have a different emphasis and focus for different leaders. So you have built-in conflict. So you have to recognize up front that we are going to have conflict. And so you have to ask our individuals in terms of their knowledge, skill, and ability set, are they tooled up? Are they prepared to work through that conflict properly and appropriately? And if not, then you need to have briefings up front that will give individuals the process, the technique, the mechanism that they need to work through conflict. But I'm, I'm going to be candid here. My experience suggests that it's not open conflict that will slow you down and make you less effective and efficient and uh, threaten your optimization. It's not the open conflict, it is the disagreement. And so when you are working with your individuals, in addition to thinking about are they properly prepared to work through conflict, ask yourself, are they properly prepared to manage disagreement? And if they are unable or if they're uncomfortable working through disagreement, then introduce the tools and techniques for that. For example, help them identify decision-making criteria so that instead of a decision relying on someone's voice or someone's opinion, you were holding up a option against criteria and you're almost mathematically making the decision. Mm, that's good. So you remove it away from the emotions or opinions, you take it down to the facts and make it rational in terms of decision making. Yes. Okay. Yes. Wonderful. Let, let's move on to question number two. I can see time is there marching along. Question. Sorry, Dipti. There, uh, there is one more question. Do we want to take it, uh, Craig? Just um, a quick is it one. A, okay, quickie. Yeah. yeah because it's about decision making, bringing them into the decision table. Shall we take an opinion advice from juniors for policy reform? If yes, in, in group or individual, individually? So juniors, yes. I think uh, Bishnu sir, he means juniors as in uh, not in the leadership team. Could you be a little precise? Teachers, okay, teachers in the decision making. Uh, 
to the extent that you can involve as many teachers as possible, I recommend that it be more than one. But if it can only be one, make sure that when you're selecting that teacher, that they have, as Craig pointed out earlier, make sure that they've got the personality and the personal style that will be needed and make sure that they represent the best interest of all the teachers. Better yet, reach out to the teachers and have them identify the individual or two or three individuals that they consider to be informal leaders and ask them to come to the table. And it's interesting because when you're putting together your ground rules for the meetings, you can say that the teachers here, they may not have equal say or equal vote, but we will take their input into consideration. But if you say that, if you promise that, you have to be able to show, you have to be able to prove that that actually occurred. Because as Craig said earlier, it is a matter of trust. And without trust, you will not have buy-in. You will not have commitment. You will not have needed contribution. Great, thank you. Question number two, strategic messaging. How can schools build stakeholder support around safety and security, success with parents, in particular during this challenging time? Well, you know, it's interesting because from my perspective, all of your actions as a leader have to be planned and purposeful. They have to be thoughtful and thorough. So anytime you are either managing or influencing or interacting with your stakeholders, then I think that your behavior, your approach, your words should be the result of previous stakeholder analysis and influence planning. And if you are operating in a, in a challenging, in a threatening environment, if you have conflict, if you have crisis underway, it's that much more important that you approach this in a planned and purposeful manner. So I recommend that you conduct a stakeholder analysis. So if you have three or four stakeholder groups, look at each group and ask, what do I need from that group? What level of understanding? What level of buy-in, commitment, contribution, and advocacy do we need? Make a note. And then think about that particular stakeholder group and ask, where does that stakeholder group currently stand? Because you may find that with each stakeholder group, three out of the five already are where they need to be in terms of their level of commitment, contribution, and advocacy. But you may find that there are two groups that are not. Then you start thinking about, how can I influence that group in a plan and purposeful way so that they're likely to move from their current level to the needed level of support. And when you start thinking of your influence plan, it's not, all, it's not about you, it's about your stakeholder group. So you have to step back and ask, what are their values? What are their objectives? What are their priorities? And you have to frame your approach to match their personality, their priorities, their goals, and their concerns. Because if you do not address their concerns, their goals, then you will never come to a meeting of the minds. I think that's really great because you can be more efficient with your time and also be more effective by identifying who you really need to move forward and are they already there and what sort of messaging types they really need. What's, what have you found who have you found are the most challenging stakeholders to try to communicate with and need the most cultivating in communication? You know, that is a, that is a question I can't answer because at different times, given different circumstances and situations, they can all be different. They can all be difficult. They can right. all be very challenging. It's, it's, if you are working with a stakeholder group, if you are not connecting with them, and if you're not monitoring that connection, then you are not going to be as efficient as you need to be. You're not going to be as effective as you need to be. In, in thinking about your stakeholders, there are a couple things to keep in mind. One is that every stakeholder group is not equally important. 
And I know that you would not want to say that in the open. You would not want to say that in public, but you do have to recognize that every stakeholder group is not equal. Therefore, some require more attention, more care, more nurturing than others. Also, if you have a stakeholder group that is not on the fence, but you know that you have already lost them in terms of their commitment, their contribution and advocacy, never focus on them to the extent that you are not paying enough attention to your other stakeholder groups. Because even though you may have a stakeholder group out here that is really against your current effort, your current thinking, your current position, you want to make sure that you are continuing to care and nurture your other stakeholder groups. Because if you have a, a, a coalition, if you have an adequate amount of, of strength then you may not have to bring that one stakeholder group along. I mean, that is the reality. It, when it comes to stakeholder analysis and stakeholder influencing, it is not smooth. It is not something that is enjoyable. It is always messy. And it is always something that you have to literally and figuratively roll your sleeves up and work on but always be thoughtful, be thorough, be intentional, and be razor sharp in terms of your focus. That's great. That's a drop the microphone moment right there. Thank you. Um, Dipti, I'll get you to just check out the um, chat and see if there's a question on this particular topic. I could see Durga and um, Kumar nodding quite vigorously during that talk. There is a question, but I don't know how in, um, you may not be liked and supported by all in a complex organization. So are there some ways that would help solve the problem? You know, if you have different levels of support in your organization, then you have to realize that you may never have the same level of support throughout your organization. So even conduct a stakeholder analysis to the members of your organization, you will determine that not every team within your organization is equally important. Again, I know that sounds harsh, but that is the reality. And you will determine that not every person in your organization carries the same weight, if you will, when it comes to your organization's existence, survival, and optimal achievement. So be very thoughtful, be very precise, be very focused in terms of how much time you spend trying to bring individuals alone who are not there for whatever reason. And at a certain point, you may have to decide that I can no longer devote energy to trying to bring that individual or that team forward. And hope what you hope will happen as you nurture and work with the other teams it will create a suction, it will create a vacuum that will just bring that other team, that other individual alone. But don't let that individual or that team that is less committed, don't let that team or individual sabotage you in terms of nurturing and supporting those that do get it and that are with you, your position, your goal, your stance. Good. Uh, Craig, there's one more question from Chandrayan, sir. He says, how do you motivate your middle level managers to implement a decision made by the board without bringing in a divide amongst the colleagues? Well, it, now, I, I, I do not want to get into uh, some bannocks or, or I do not want to, uh, but just remember that you cannot motivate your mid-management. You cannot motivate anyone. The only thing you can do is to manipulate, modify, orchestrate, or mold an environment that is likely to support their being self-motivated. And so that's the challenge, and that's the question you're always asking. If this is a decision that is coming from an outside body, and sometimes it is an outside external regulatory body, and when that, when that information comes in, the first thing that we need to do is acknowledge that this is not a decision that we made. 
this is a decision that was made that we are being asked to implement, that we're being asked to abide by. And from now on, our decisions will be consistent with and supportive of that. And we as a team, we're expected to move forward accordingly. And sometimes you have to let individuals who disagree with that, you have to let them know that the reality is this is not up for vote. This is not a democracy and that we are being directed. And if we, if I, as your leader, if I do not abide by this, if I do not make decisions and act accordingly, they will find someone who will. And that trickles down throughout the entire organization. You, you, you know, given today's, con we are in a complex world, we are in a challenging world, the threats are numerous. And so we have to recognize that we have to work together to get through this just to survive. And then once we survive, we can start thinking about becoming more optimal, but we've got to work together. And unfortunately, the reality is if you have team members, whether it's mid-management or not, who are not willing to get on board, you may have to make some difficult decisions. You do all you can to support them. You do all you can to nurture them and develop them and help them grow. And you literally move mountains to do that. But you can't motivate them. It's self-motivation. They make a decision. They make a choice every morning. And hopefully it's the right decision and it's the right choice. Great. Thank you, BK. So question number three, it's about growth and succession. Where are the opportunities to strategically grow leadership and team members? Craig, instead of an hour, could we spend two or three days on this? <laughs> So uh, these are great questions. And when I saw all of your questions and I kind of stood back and started looking at the patterns and the trends, it, it, it just excited me to spend time with you today because you were so strategic in terms of your thinking and your orientation. And to me, this, this is a key question. Uh, when, and, and I'll step back and I'll, and I'll say this, that when it comes to leadership, Leadership without strategic thinking may lack optimal focus, and strategic thinking without leadership will, in all odds, lack optimal influence and impact. And so just in that statement, there are two areas for succession development, strategic thinking and strategic leadership. When it comes to strategic thinking, there are three monitor the environment, and they identify trends and patterns. The second is that they strive to make credible decisions. And the third, strategic leaders, they identify risk and they manage risk. So when you think of individuals in the pipeline, when you think of prospective successors, when you think of individuals who will become the future leaders of your organization, ask yourself, do you have individuals who are strategic thinkers and strategic leaders? And remember, leadership is not a role or a position or a title. It is the way you think and the way you identify opportunities to influence others in a positive and planned way that leads to mutual beneficial results and outcomes. So those are two areas that immediately come to mind, strategic thinking and strategic leadership. Wow. That's a big concept. Dipti, do we have any questions in the chat on that? Oh, we could drill, 
we could drill. <laughs> I guess everyone is internalizing it. <laughs> it's a big topic. Uh, there, yeah, I, I guess, you know, you can just talk hours on it. There's a question, though. Uh, does one become a strategic thinker or leader by being thorough, intentionally, and aware or vice versa? It's interesting because if you have an individual who is thinking and acting in a manner that is perceived to be thoughtful and thorough, that is perceived to be intentional, and is perceived by others to reflect personal and situational awareness, then that individual is typically generally considered to be a strategic thinker. If you have a leader who is searching and responding to trends and patterns, who strives to make credible decisions, and who identify and manage risk, then they are typically described as strategic leaders. And this is not my opinion. Uh, for a, a, my most recent book that was published through Wiley, uh, I and, and my co-author, we spent almost two or three years uh, interviewing, surveying, having personal conversations with 300 leading leaders around the world. So this was a global research effort, and we basically asked individuals to identify individuals that they know, that they work with, that they interact with, who they deem as strategic thinkers and strategic leaders. And we had interviews with those individuals asking, so why do you think that? Why, why do you conclude, why do you perceive that individual as being strategic? And then we went out and had conversations with those individuals and asked them, what differentiates your behavior from the behavior of others that may not be considered to be as strategic? And so this was the, 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 the result of a lot of research because we did our, you know, our typical review of the literature, but it was also involving action research that we conducted over about a two or three year period. Great. Dipti, we might um, move on to the next question just because of time and do the other questions at the end if that's okay. Thank you. I can see that um, Shankar was agreeing with the rest of us and saying great in the chat to that answer. Uh, question four, tools. Dr. BK, tools. Please yes. share some tools or techniques that any leader can use to assist a deeper and broader level of strategic planning? Oh, gosh. You know, it's interesting. Uh, again, uh, very thoughtful questions. I, I, I can just tell that I would love to spend a, a day or two or three with you, all of you having personal conversations and interactions because of the nature of your thinking. Uh, uh, excellent. Uh, and this is a good question. I recently was in Singapore and I was spending uh, uh, a full day with 300 executives. And so one of the tools that I'm about to share was identified by that group as one of the most interesting, beneficial and useful tools that they've ever been introduced to. Uh, and so uh, one, and so there's two tools. Uh, one tool relates to deepening your thinking. And this, this tool is called the five whys. And so if you think about, for example, someone who habitually, constantly comes into work late, they arrive at the office constantly 15 minutes late. Most of the time, we as the leader, we as the manager or supervisor will approach that individual and we'll ask, why are you late? And they will give us an answer and then we will disengage. Well, it's interesting, if you ask the why only once, typically the answer relates to that particular event. But if you receive the answer to the first why and then ask a second why, then the answer to that second why typically will give you situational or circumstantial If you stop there, then you still do not have the root cause 
you are at the situational or circumstantial level. If you, to that answer, ask another why, then you're starting to drill down from not the event, not from the situation or the circumstance, but you're becoming closer and closer and closer to the root cause. And the reason you want to know the root cause is that that has what you have to tackle. That's what you have to address. That is what you have to solve. Because if you do not solve the root cause, then odds are the behavior will resurface at a different time. It may not look the same. It may not sound the same. It may feel differently but you're still dealing with the same root issue. So in terms of deepening your analysis, deepening your thinking, consider the five whys. Ask the why, and then ask the why to that answer, ask the why to that, and typically, not all the time, but typically five whys will get you to the root cause. Now, sometimes you'll find that it only takes three, sometimes it may take seven, but typically five. So that's the five whys. That's for deepening. Now for broadening in, there is a tool that is, it's the formal name is the Ishikawa diagram. Don't ask me to spell it. <laughs> Don't ask me to spell it, but it's the Ishikawa diagram, more commonly referred to as the fishbone diagram. And the fishbone diagram gives you factors to consider and forces to consider when you are analyzing an issue, when you're thinking through a consideration. So, you know, we all have personal preferences. We all have natural preferences. In this day and age, we, uh, many of us are, uh, we have a, uh, we, we lean toward, we have a preference for thinking about technology. So if there is an issue, if there's a challenge, Oftentimes we frame it as a technologically challenge, or we think of it as a challenge that can be solved through technology. Well, if you are the proverbial carpenter, then if you only carry a hammer, then everything's going to look like a nail and everything's going to be solved by the hammer and a nail. Well, what we have to do is strategic thinkers is we have to broaden our thinking to include other factors. And if you put these factors out, you can literally put it out in what looks like a fish. Don't worry about what it looks like, but here are factors that I always encourage leaders to consider if they're dealing with a challenge, a threat, a consideration. Here are some factors. One is your strategy. Two is your structure. Three are your systems and processes. Four is your technology. And then five are your people capabilities and capacity. And then and if you think about that on your hand, the, what's in the middle, your palm, is the most important. If you think about your fingers, without your palm, they're worthless. Without your palm, they cannot bend. They do not have flexibility. They do not have strength. So in the middle of the five is your culture. And your culture trumps everything. So always think about if there is an issue, think in terms of, is it based in terms of our strategy, our structure, our systems and processes, our technology, or our people capabilities or capacity, or is it a cultural challenge? That's when you're diagnosing, when you're analyzing, but when you are beyond analysis, when you're beyond your diagnosis and you start thinking about solutions, again, we all, especially in this day and age, we lean toward technology, we lean toward technological solutions, but what we have to think about is what might we do about our structure, 
our strategy, our systems and processes, our technology, our people and capability, our people capability and capacity, as well as our culture to solve this problem, to address this challenge, to overcome this threat. So the five whys deepens, the Ishikawa or the fishbone diagram broadens. Two very effective tools that can be easily used. It can be used on the back of a piece of paper. I can see in the chat that um, Ambika has invited you to come and stay for a couple of days in Kathmandu. So make sure you have your bags ready for that. <laughs> and Kumar's, Kumar actually commented in the chat that um, using the five whys, by the time you get to the fifth why, you might dig the root out completely. And I would imagine yeah. solve the problem. Yeah. Oh, okay. you can, yeah, it's interesting because by the time you're getting to the fifth whys, a lot of times people's eyes light up and sometimes they kind of start because they become uncomfortable because they know that you finally have gotten to the key point and it makes yeah. them very uncomfortable. Awesome. Uh, question number five is about navigating conflict. And you may spend a short period of time on this since we've already talked about conflict, but it says, how can leaders maintain and even increase professional communication in times of conflict and crisis? I'm, I am going to zero in on, I'm going to focus on the word communication because I think that the key is how do you do that within an environment that is tumultuous, that is uncertain, that is full of churn, that's, that's conflict. It's just, by the way, it sounds like what we're currently involved in and what's currently surrounding us. Well, you have to become laser focused. You have to determine of all the things that we have to consider, of all the points that we want to communicate, what are the most critical, what are the most important? What are the most valuable? Not to me, but to the person who will be receiving the communique, whether it's verbal or written. So be very intentional in terms of your communication. By the way, when it comes to what's currently occurring in your world, in your organization, and in the life of your staff and your faculty, you have to think about how complex it is. And when conflict is underway, you may have to give yourself, your team, your organization permission to start resorting the priorities. Because when you're under conflict, you only focus on the highest priorities. You think about the mission critical and you only act on the mission critical priorities. Whenever you're communicating, uh, try to make it as personal as possible and also leverage your communication hubs. So if you would just think about your team or your expanded team, not everyone plays the same role in terms of communication. If you think of a typical team, there's always one individual in a team that if there is a question that people have, they typically go to him or her. If there is a key point that needs to be made, they typically go to him or her. If, if there is a point that you would like to make that you know will get throughout your team, you make sure that he or her, or he or sh and she, they, you share that message with them. You, you have hubs in every stakeholder group, in every level, both horizontal and every department vertically in your organization. So be very thoughtful, identify your hubs and funnel that communication through those hubs as well as sharing it with the larger population. That's really good. It's using the, uh, the water cooler or the gossip train for a positive purpose. Yes, yes. BK, I was thinking that as you're talking about that and the, the tumultuous time that everyone is in right now, with your exposure to such a range of organizations internationally, are you seeing a rise in conflict in organizations right now? 
I'm seeing a lot of, I do not want to say conflict. And, I'll, and, and I do not want to overstate the breadth of my involvement and connection around the world. But in my small corner of the world, in my small globe, I am seeing relationships that are being challenged because, you know, seldom do we operate in a silo. Seldom, seldom are we isolated or insulated. We truly are a global community. And there are a lot of organizations that interact with others, that are interdependent of others, that rely on others. And, and whether it's your supplier or your distributor, or if you, there are so many strategic alliances and relationships and communities out here. And unfortunately, we are all under threat. We are all having to take defensive postures. And oftentimes that defensive posture, when it comes to how it relates to and pertains to others in our alliance, it may not be as a favorable a move to them as it is to you. But we're all having to take decisive steps to survive this and get through this. There are many strained relationships. There, there is a lot of fear. I hear individuals say that, well, for that organization, that move is just a sniffle, but to us, it's pneumonia. It may be a small inconvenience for them, but because they are no longer producing that, we are at risk. Our survival is at stake. And, and it is, um, it, it, it is it's, it, to me as a person, as a human being, as, as a member of this global community, it's very concerning to me because I know that we all need to come together to get through this and to survive. And, but we have a tendency to be very siloed in our thinking. We need, we've got to be thinking globally now and not locally. I think on that point, it's good to just reflect that as leaders and um, managers and organizations that the people who work for us um, often everything else in their life is in turmoil and the world and their environment is toxic just because of all that change and, and difficulty. And we have an opportunity to actually provide a safe space and a calm space within our organization and provide some structure and some predictability and some trust and consistency that they may not have out there, but within our organization, just by slowing down a little bit and providing, like you said, the time to become accustomed with how we need to respond to the situation. We can actually provide for our staff and our team a respite, a safe place from all the craziness that's going on, as much as within, as our, within our own control to actually do that. So, and, and you raise an, an, an excellent point. You can only control what you can control. And so I would encourage you all as strategic leaders to think about what do individuals need? What do they require? And in terms of what I have at my control, what can I do? What can I possibly do to assist and support them? And I think that's the perfect time for the last question, which is, what is the one thing, Dr. BK, that, that good leaders, effective leaders have in common? So how much time do I have? <laughs> uh, uh, I, think, I think literally about three take minutes. Your time. But <laughs> three minutes. Okay. Please take your well, time. <laughs> there, there are like three layers to that question, uh, but so I will stay at the top layer that I, and I do hope that the top layer you find interesting, useful, and beneficial. Uh, the research that's been done around strategic leadership and more importantly, contextual and situational leadership uh, suggests that uh, regardless of your discipline, regardless of your profession or industry, regardless of your endeavor, if you want 
to be perceived by others to be a leader. And if you, regardless of your endeavor, if you want to think and act as a leader, then you have to make it, you, and this is critical, you absolutely must make it easy for your followers to answer three fundamental questions. So, so hear me again, regardless of how much conflict, regardless of the big crisis, regardless of how much uncertainty and ambiguity, regardless of how much churn is in your organization, when it comes to the relationship that you have with your followers, you through your words and your actions have to make it absolutely easy for them to answer these three questions that every follower has of his or her leader. One, where are you leading me? So that suggests that when you are communicating, when you're interacting with, when you're working with, when you are interfacing with your followers and you are thinking about where you are leading them and when you're communicating that, do that in the words and the terminology and the phrasing that resonates with them, that they can understand. If you are with individuals who are in the boiler room, you do not approach them and speak to them as though they are in the boardroom and vice versa. So make it easy for your followers to answer the question, where are you leading me? Second question, that you absolutely through your words and actions have to prove to your followers so that they can answer this, why should I follow you? Why should I follow you? Given your circumstance, given your situation, given your context, given your followers, you may have to put forth extra energy to prove to them that you trust them. Or you might have to put forth extra energy to prove that they can trust you. You may have to, given your particular followers, be extra nurturing. Or you may have to provide much more guidance and direction. But it's not about you, it's about them. You're determining what they need, and then through your words and actions, proven to them that you are worthy. And I think that sometimes leaders, they get so caught up in their titles or their positions or their roles that they forget that they should feel honored and they should feel their being a leader as a privilege. So make it easy for your followers to answer the question, why should I follow you? And then the third question that all effective, all good leaders can, their followers can easily answer is how are you going to help me arrive at your intended destination? How are you going to assist and support me so that we will all together arrive at your intended destination. How are you going to assist me, support me? How are you going to either give me permission to rethink and reprioritize, or how are you going to give me and our organization permission to reshuffle the priorities given the new priorities? How are you going to give me permission to perhaps struggle, to work through the awkwardness and the uncertainty? How are you going to, in all the ways, shapes and forms, how are you going to assist us so that we all arrive at the destination together? I can see people in the in the comments and the questions. Doug has been writing the questions down and people commenting and um, that's fantastic. Uh, Kumar has asked a question. I'd like Dr. Simerson to give an example of a razor sharp focus. Oh gosh. There is an organization that is very diverse in its focus, very diverse in its emphasis. They have roughly 12 
goals. They have what they consider to be 12 strategic imperatives. So when during normal times, during the certain times, during the times when everyone is safe from having certain assumptions and, and expectations, they focus equally on all of those strategic goals, all of those strategic imperatives. However, these are not regular times. These are uncertain times. So they have keeping all of the imperatives and goals in mind because you want to make sure that your decisions and actions are consistently supportive of them all, but they have given their people permission to focus on four of those strategic imperatives because right now, that's in essence the best that they can expect. That is the best that they can do. So in terms of their objectives, they have re-communicated and re-emphasized the performance objectives, both the team and individual, that relate to those particular uh, strategic goals. In terms of their management system, they are monitoring actions, activities, and results on a daily basis to make sure that when it comes to those particular goals, they are having the progress, they are having the contribution, they're having the result and outcome that they absolutely require. And when they have their uh, morning check-ins, when they open up their laptops and see the, uh, the, the daily dashboard, the assessment information, the evaluation information, the metric information that they see on a daily basis do not relate to all of the strategic goals. It relates to those critical few. So that's how they're razor sharp. They're razor sharp in terms of reinforcing expectations. They're razor sharp in terms of monitoring what is important. And they're razor sharp in terms of the criteria they use to evaluate progress and success. And they're razor sharp in terms of providing feedback and emphasis to that particular assessment data when they share it with their executives, their managers, and everyone. Thank you, Craig. There are two questions in the chat. So we will take those two questions and maybe one more. Uh, one question is, is a good leader the one who has a very, very progressive business or the one who has lots of people who are inspired by him? <laughs> I believe that might be a, uh, that that is a, Simple question. It only took you a, a, a fraction of a second to ask, but that is a complex question. Okay. With the information I currently have in hand, I would say it is the, the, with the, the leader or the executive with the cohesive group, the committed group, the self-motivated and self-confident group. And the reason I say that is if you have that aligned and unified team behind you, regardless of your environment, regardless of the threats or opportunities, and even in terms of your internal environment. You, every, every organization, they have weaknesses, they have strengths. So put all that together, if you have that aligned and unified team, you're probably going to be in a better opportunistic position to take advantage of the either current or emerging opportunities and you are also most likely to be able to work together as a team to either mitigate, reduce, or avoid those either current or emerging threats. Uh, and so, you know, if your, your team can be optimal in terms of its results and outcomes, but there may be a market or in an environmental force that is causing your results and outcomes to be momentarily down, but regardless of the circumstance and situation and context, that unified, aligned team, that's what I would rely on. Excellent question. That was a good question. Well, they've all been good questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Simerson. There's a catch-21 question here, but I would like to take it up. 
Schools have low income these days, so they are paying about 50% salary, salary to employees. But we need employees with higher level of motivation and higher level of working spirit. How is it possible? That's the challenge. And you know, you're dealing with the reality. The first is you, in, in order for you to maximize your ability to influence your followers, and in order for you to maximize your strength as a leader, you always have to come across as being an authentic, genuine person. So given what you just described, I think that you need to kind of have a, 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 fire, a fireplace chat with your people and let them know that we are all in this together that these are rough times. We may not survive. We may not survive as a profession. And because of what you are experiencing, it's not because decisions that the board's making, it's not decisions that I'm making, it is what is occurring out in the environment. And because you're out there, once you leave the doors and the evenings, you realize what all is transpiring you realize how much churning chaos is out there. So that is what's causing us to have to make the tough decisions that we're having to make. And, you know, be authentic and genuine. Let them know that you know, you recognize, you acknowledge that they are working at 50% of what they should be earning. So what you can do is focus not on the reward, but on the recognition. And so because the reward is out of your hands, focus on the recognition. And you know, it's interesting when people talk about what they value and what gives them meaning in life, it's not the reward. They want to do something that is meaningful. They want to really contribute to either their family their local community or their expanded community, and they want to receive recognition. So what you can do as a leader is to comment time and time again and reinforce the message that what we do as educators, it is meaningful. I mean, one day each of us will be able to put our either our grandchild or great-grandchild on our knee and, and bounce that little grandchild or great grandchild up and down and say, this is what your great, great, this is what I did. I was a teacher. I benefited people and families and communities. And you can be proud of that. Also give them recognition when recognition is due. You know, if you give everyone the same amount of recognition, the recognition becomes not as valuable. So when someone does do something that is exemplary, be sure to recognize them for that. And, and a lot of times that is all that's needed. The recognition is, it, it is, it, we as a species thrive on recognition. And when it, when it's possible, you may not be able to give them more salary, but do something else to recognize their achievement and make it easier for them to continue achieving. And that might be to give them some time to do some personal reflection. It might be for you to give them structure so that they can come together and share lessons learned and best practices so that they become even a stronger professional. That may be more meaningful to them than they're receiving a 1% increase in salary. So always be thinking about the meaningfulness, their contribution and achievement, and their recognition. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Simerson. That was very well said. There is a question, in a win-loss or win-lose decision-making situation, is it okay to veto the opinion of others for institutional benefit or go by 
the majority consensus and respect their opinion? Uh, one thing that I would, uh, and, and again, we live in a world of reality. We, we, we live in the real world. So oftentimes this is not possible, but if in any way possible, I would recommend you're stepping back, perhaps trying to shift your orientation or your perspective so that instead of it being a win loss, you can somehow reframe the situation so it becomes a win-win. And a lot of times that is finding criteria that's associated with the law side that are related to the win side so that even though they continue to lose on certain fronts, on other fronts, it really is a win for everyone. So that's one. The second is that I know that the reality is that a lot of times we vote, but I recommend that we come to consensus rather than just straightforward voting. Because when you come to consensus, you're taking the multitude of factors into consideration and you're trying to come to a negotiated agreement or negotiated terms so that again, it all becomes a win-win and it's not a win-lose. So I would try to force a consensus rather than voting. But at the end of the day, you are wanting to go with the best decisions. So whether it is from one or many, take the recommendation, the suggestion, the suggested solution, hold it against your decision criteria and make a rational decision based on your criteria. And as I said, when I was introducing the five and the hand, always remember that culture trumps everything. So whether it is a recommended solution from one or many, if it goes against your culture, your culture will probably defeat it. So always keep that in mind. Thank you. We'll just take one more question now. Um, is it important for a leader to intervene or conflict promptly at the initial stage or should they wait to see how things go before intervening? That is an excellent question. There is, um, I'm going to draw a very quick diagram. Sorry, it, it will only take a second. That's why I took this question. <laughs> I thought that would be the last, thank you. <laughs> this is, so what you're describing is you have a conflict between A and B and you have the leader. And so you have a conflict between A and B and you're asking if the leader should immediately intervene and address the conflict. What I recommend is that if at all possible, executives, managers, supervisors, leaders, never put themselves, intentionally put themselves in a triangular situation. Rather, if you have individuals that are disagreeing or are experiencing conflict, as a leader, as a, an executive manager or supervisor, brief them, have conversations with them either together or individually to give them the knowledge, skills, and capabilities to work through that disagreement, to work through that conflict together so that they do not approach you to solve the disagreement or the conflict because it is the reason you ask the five whys. You ask the five whys because you realize that if you do not address the root problem, it will resurface. If you do not address the root problem that they do not possess the ability to work through the disagreement or conflict, they will be back. Because we live in a very complex world. We live in a very ever-changing world so there will be a situation and a circumstance in the near future that creates that disagreement or conflict. Well, you want them to work it out between themselves, not come to you as the top of the pyramid to address it for them. Excellent Thank you. Question. Thank Excellent. you. Thank you so much. An amazing answer. <laughs> uh, may I give the screen to you, Craig, so that you can just round up the entire thing and then I will end it. Certainly. 
Well, Dr. BK, I really want to thank you for your time, your thoughts, your wisdom, and the way that you've answered those questions on the fly from your experience. <laughs> So that was really, really great. And thank you, everybody, for your great questions as well. I think what really stood out for me um, absolutely has to be the five whys. I think that's a fantastic technique to, to use. And I know that you've mentioned to me before about the Ishikawa diagram, and I want to dig a little bit deeper into the Ishikawa diagram so that I can think a bit broader, broader in my thinking as well. I love this hand picture because in my mind, I can see how powerful that culture is, how it makes everything else work. And being a technology guy, I'm always thinking in terms of technology, but I must remember the other four fingers, the structures and the people and their competencies and things like that. So look, I've got, as I showed everybody, I've got, I've got three pages worth of notes and wisdom and nuggets that I'm taking away to think on. And I just encourage all of you to take a moment um, tomorrow or even tonight and just reflect on your notes, reflect on what you've heard tonight, and then pick out a couple of things that you could share with your staff. Because we as educators and as principals, as leaders, we are the leading learners. And when we demonstrate and we show our staff that we're always learning and always trying to get better, it makes those conversations about learning for them so much more authentic as well, because we're showing that we are learning and we're on the learning journey as well. So again, thank you everyone for coming. I'll hand back over to, to Dipti and thank you Dipti and 3DI for making this happen. And Dr. BK, you're awesome. Ah, I really enjoy You muted, muted yourself. You muted yourself. <laughs> I apologize. Uh, I was just saying, I hope that everyone has a great evening. Stay safe and take care of yourself. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Simerson, for the wonderful takeaways that um, we had right now. It's been wonderful. And maybe I'll ask Regina to give the ending remarks. I can see people are already moving away. They're giving all the thank yous in the chat. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. And thank you, Dr. Simerson and uh, Craig, for this wonderful session, for your time, in fact, you know, this one hour session. And I would like to thank you, Kes, and uh, Mrs. Gipti Acharya for, you know, bringing everyone under the same roof. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. I'm sure we are going to have more sessions like this, and we'll obviously call all of you again. Uh, we are sorry, we are in the Google form, we forgot to put the email address, so we really had to dig in you know, to send the Zoom address. But uh, we already have all of your contact details, so if there is anything else, then we'll definitely let you know. But thank you to the QKS team, thank you to 3DI, and thank you to Craig. And most of all, thank you to Dr. Simerson for this wonderful uh, session. And um, um, heads up, I think you know this has been one of my favorite moments in the past few months. So thank you so much for giving all the, these nuggets of wisdom to us. Like Craig said, even I have about three, four pages, and I'm really going to review them tonight. Thank you all for coming. Good night and a good day thank to you, you, Dr. Simerson and Craig. <laughs> thank you so much, everyone, once again. Thank you, Matt. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, 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 bye. Thank you so much. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you. I'm going to take bye. a photo. Smile. Yes. Regina, did you take pictures? Yes, ma'am. I've taken screenshots. Three. Okay. Two. <laughs> one. Awesome. Bye, everybody. Thank you, BK. Bye. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Great questions, everybody. That was really awesome. I learned a lot. Thanks, everyone. It was a really wonderful session. <laughs> yeah, really thank, you, thank you, thank you. Thanks, thank Regina. You, Thanks, Vicky.